As previews unfold for the Lost Caverns of Ixalan, many Magic the Gathering players ask the question, uh, what does that card do? No, seriously, can you just give me the gist of it? Let's be honest, looking at recent Magic the Gathering sets, you may very well be asking, whatever happened to vanilla cards? Well, they're pretty much gone, and if you feel like Magic the Gathering cards are getting more and more complicated, you're right, complexity creep is a real thing, and though in Magic the Gathering, the conversation is oft wrapped around the idea of product fatigue, seldom do people point out just how overly complex and wordy these new cardboard pieces are becoming. This video will explain and explore complexity creep, its causes and effects. Never mind whether or not Magic the Gathering cards are getting overly wordy and cumbersome, they are, but what exactly is this doing to the game, and can anything be done about it? Let's dive right in. But first, a word from our sponsor, Quezzel Space Adventures. So what is a Quezzel? It's an experience that goes beyond a traditional 1,000 piece puzzle into a story with quests and mini games. This Quezzel is a sequel to the amazing Cappadocia Quezzel, but this time you'll be exploring space with four different factions. Quezzel is made by Unidragon in collaboration with the renowned IC4 Design Studio. The art is so detailed and fun. The the quality of the puzzles is amazing, with really cool piece shapes that match the theme. So not only do you get a very fun, high quality 1000 piece puzzle, but when you finish, you begin a new adventure. My son especially loved the model ships that you can make. Yeah, it's appealing to small children, I suppose. Yeah, they shoot things! Putting them together was like getting four Lego sets, and they really shoot and become part of the game after you make the puzzle. And that's only one of the mini games that's inside. There's so much thought and detail that has gone into this product. Even opening the box is part of the game. So if you love high quality puzzles and want to take it to the next level, check out Quezzle Space Adventures. And if you are still not convinced, I have two words for you. Space dinosaurs. Oh yeah! Thank you, Unidragon, for sponsoring this video. Let's begin by looking at a card from the most recent set. Ashiok, Wicked Manipulator, was the face card for Wilds of Eldraine. And due to a shift in Planeswalker philosophy, Ashiok is the only Planeswalker that we got in that set. Which is a good thing, because Ashiok, Wicked Manipulator, has enough text on it to fill the text box of two Planeswalkers. Wilds of Eldraine, Ashiok, is a 5 mana, 5 loyalty, mono black Planeswalker, with 3 sizable loyalty abilities and a static ability that would make the Planeswalkers in War of the Spark feel inadequate. Ashiok's static ability reads, if you would pay life while your library has at least that many cards in it, exile that many cards from the top of your library instead. Okay, fair enough. This Ashiok must have something to do with paying life then, right? Well, let's see. Ashiok's plus one ability is, look at the top two cards of your library, exile one and put the other in your hand. Their negative two ability creates two 1-1 one -one nightmare creature tokens with, at the beginning of combat on your turn, if a card was put into exile this turn, put a plus one plus one counter on this creature. Got it? Good, because there's more. Ashiok's ultimate says, target player exiles the top X cards of their library, where X is the total mana value of cards you own in exile. So wait, let me get this straight. Ashiok's novel of a static ability doesn't actually have anything to do with any of their loyalty abilities? So what is all this for then? Look at how simple planeswalkers used to be. Plus two, we both draw a card. Negative one, only I may draw a card. Negative ten, you mill twenty. Clean, simple, evocative. If Lorwyn Jace Balaran saw Wilds of Eldraine Ashiok's text box, he'd start crying and throwing up simultaneously. Is this just what magic is now? Every card has a wall of text as tall as the Tower of Babel? How did we get here? Complexity creep is a cousin of an oft-discussed problem inherent to any game that consists of a never-ending flow of new game pieces. Power creep. If you want your consumer base to buy your new product, you have to make that product desirable. You can do this either by breaking new ground in game design, or you can just make the new game pieces so game-breakingly strong that players have no choice but to buy them in order to keep up. 
The topic of power creep in Magic the Gathering is nothing new. When Spiritmonger was first printed in Apocalypse, the player base lost its collective mind. Many Magic the Gathering players couldn't imagine a stronger creature. A 6-6 for 5 mana with no downside that can regenerate itself? and continues to grow whenever a creature dies? What is Wizards of the Coast thinking? But 22 years and nearly 100 new sets later, five mana six sixes with no downside barely register as good anymore. I mean, look at Spiritmonger alongside Elder Gargaroth. At least you can fly over Spiritmonger, but as long-standing as the power creep discussion has been, in the last couple of years, the dial on power creep has been turned up to 11, and then 12. 12, and then 13, and then oops, we're just skipping 14 and going all the way up to 15. Just look at Raghavan. When it was printed only two years ago, it was the best creature Modern had ever seen. Now, at the first Pro Tour since Raghavan entered the format, many players were too afraid to register the monkey because it was too weak in the face of the newest oppressive force on the format, Orcish Bowmasters. A single Orcish Bowmasters, uh, yes, that is is a singular plural, can single-handedly answer three Raghavans, pinging the first one, blocking the second with its orc army token, and then simply stepping in front of the third monkey itself. I can't believe I'm even saying this. Raghavan Nimble Pilferer is getting power crept out of Modern, only two years after Modern Horizons 2. Unfortunately, power creep is inevitable to some degree, given that Magic the Gathering is a product, first and foremost, and Hasbro will accept nothing short of record profits year after year after year from its Coastal Wizards subsidiary. Modern Horizons 2 was the best-selling Magic the Gathering set of its time, and the best-performing decks in every Every competitive tournament are now full of cards from only the last two to three years of sets. But while it's too late to put the toothpaste back in the tube with power creep, increasing the power level of new cards doesn't necessarily make Magic less fun. The trend that is much more concerning for the longevity of Magic is the drastic increase in card complexity that we've seen in recent years. What's special about Yargle and Multani? Yes, it is an 18-6. It has the highest power ever printed on a black border creature, but there's something else unique about this legendary frog tree collab beyond that the card is a literal embodiment of power creep. Yargle and Multani is the first vanilla creature printed in an expansion set since Spined Karak and Ageless Guardian appeared in Strixhaven. For those historians keeping track at home, Strixhaven predates Raghavan. A vanilla creature is a creature without any abilities, just a power and toughness stat line, a creature type, and a mana cost. For two years and across eight standard sets, from Adventures in the Forgotten Realms through Phyrexia All Will Be One, creatures without abilities had utterly vanished from Magic the Gathering's printing presses. With standard rotating every four sets, that means we saw an entire entire standard format come and go without a single plain old vanilla creature. No grizzly bears, no savannah lions, not even a hill giant. For essentially Magic the Gathering's entire existence, vanilla creatures were the foundation upon which magic creature design was built. It's why we call two mana two twos grizzly bears and one mana two one savannah lions. They're simple, evocative, and they give context to the other more complex and exciting creatures around them. Stoneforge Mystic is made more exciting because Squire exists. Not only that, but vanilla creatures also play an important role in the grok ability of a new set. Every new set since the beginning of Magic the Gathering has been packed full of new cards that you need to read and learn in order to play with. This is especially true in Limited. If you're drafting a new set, it's exhausting to have to read every single card in every single pack that goes around the table. Vanilla creatures give you a little break. Your eye can slide right over them while you go, great, 4-5 for four generic and a black. What else we got? When a set has no vanilla creatures, its complexity flows floor is raised, making the limited environment less accessible to newer players and the game as a whole more mentally taxing to play. Thus, until Adventures in the Forgotten Realms, a standard set without a vanilla creature was virtually unheard of. So where did they go? Well, if you look at the standard sets we've seen over the past two years, the answer is that they became French vanilla. 
A French vanilla creature is one whose only ability or abilities are key words, such as a tutu with life link. The idea, presumably, is that vanilla creatures aren't good enough to put in your deck anymore, and therefore putting them in a set is a waste of design space. But if you take vanilla creatures out of your set, all you're doing is creating a new category of worst creatures in the set. French vanilla creatures are the new runt of the litter, not worth the cardstock they're printed on in the eyes of many Magic the Gathering players. March of the Machines had eight French vanilla creatures. Phyrexia, all will be one, had two. Brothers War had between seven and eleven, depending on whether you count prototype creatures as French vanilla. Dominaria United had eight. New Capenna had three. Neon Dynasty had five. Drink these keyworded critters in. This is the new complexity floor for Magic the Gathering. This is your new mental break when looking over a draft pack at Friday Night Magic. But if that's the new complexity floor, where's the ceiling? Well, you might regret asking that question. Remember our buddy Spiritmonger? Well, here's our newest addition to the 5 mana 6-6 six, six creature club. If Magic players in 2001 lost their minds over Spiritmonger, Vorinclex, the Grand Evolution, would give them a heart attack. I'm not even going to read all this text to you. If I were to try, it would take so long that most of you would just shut the video off, and viewer retention is important. Just don't forget this has reach, okay? What's even more ridiculous than Vorinclex is that many Magic the Gathering players didn't even bat an eye at this guy. This is what the game has become. Mountains of text on every creature. Sometimes more than one mountain, as there's occasionally a second mountain on the back side of the card. I never thought I'd miss reading the word Deckmaster. Do you remember what each of the Deans from Strixhaven does? Both sides. Can you name all the activated abilities on Pioneer Staple Pestilent Call? Aldrin? What the heck does this card do? What is this? How am I supposed to remember all of this? And keep in mind, I'm likely playing with or against this on a board state with 10 other cards like this in a multiplayer game of four players. Mechanics have gotten more complicated lately too. Adventure, mutate, ability counters, venture into the dungeon, day night, the initiative, attractions, freaking stickers. When will it end? We have creatures that have a keyword ability, but that keyword ability does a different thing depending on how many times it's resolved in a single turn. And if it's resolved too many times, it doesn't do anything at all. Within Pioneer Rakdos Midrange, there are two cards that either are creatures or can become creatures that both exile stuff from a graveyard when they attack. Graveyard Trespasser and Hive of the Eye Tyrant. Now, remember that Graveyard Trespasser also exiles a card when it enters the battlefield, whereas Hive of the Eye Tyrant only does it when it attacks. If Graveyard Trespasser exiles a creature, it drains your opponent for one life. Whereas Hive of the Eye Tyrant has no additional claws after the card gets exiled. Graveyard Trespasser has Ward, discard a card, while Hive of the Eye Tyrant has Menace. The backside of Graveyard Trespasser is a 4-4 that has almost the same abilities as its frontside counterpart, though it can exile two cards instead of just one. Those two cards can be from different graveyards, unlike Unlicensed Terse, of course, which can only exile cards from the same graveyard. And, of course, there's Corpse Appraiser from the same set, which can also exile a card from a graveyard, but only a creature card and only when it enters play. And then there's Battles, which as of right now are only ever Sieges, which enter play on your opponent's side of the field, and that they can defend, though they may also want to destroy them, but that you own and want to deal damage to, which is different than destroying them. But at some point down the line we will get more battles that aren't Sieges, which therefore operate differently than the Sieges we got in March of the Machine, though they will still be battles and are therefore affected by all cards that refer to battles or permanents. Planeswalkers can have static abilities now, effectively making them enchantments that can be attacked, not to be confused with battles which are also a little bit like enchantments you can attack. Never mind people who have been playing since the beginning, the game as it exists right now is almost unrecognizable to someone who took a break in, let's say, 2018. Every new card in every new set has a mountain of text, often with brand new mechanics that you have to learn in addition to whatever rules text is on the card. Every new card that is, except French vanilla creatures, which just have a modest ability keyword or three. But if this is what's changed in only five years, what will the game look like in another five years? 
How about 10 years? Will we look back on Vorenklex in 2033 with the same aw, isn't that quaint attitude that we look back on Spiritmonger with today? Is magic, as it exists today, the least complex that it will ever be again? Some amount of complexity is inherent to magic. A game so intricate with so many variables and such a deep pool of game pieces that the chances that humans ever design a computer that can play it as well as a computer can play chess or poker is a pipe dream. That intricacy is wonderful. It's why we keep coming back to the game set after set after ever more frequent set. But the reason the game is accessible despite its complexity is the collective efforts that Wizards of the coast and the player base have made over the years to keep it that way. We don't need to write, every time this creature deals damage, you gain that much life on cards anymore. We can just write life link. We keyword concepts like mill, surveil, and landfall to make the game more simple. And until a couple of years ago, we toss a few basic generic creatures into new sets that just have a power and toughness, easing the mental strain from reading text box after text box, and so that the other more complicated cards feel more special. Is magic a better game if grizzly bears are replaced by mesa unicorns? Does a textbook in the text box make a card more exciting? What makes a game fun? And at what point have the game pieces for Magic the Gathering become unnecessarily complicated and convoluted? The truth is, it feels as though gone are the days when reading the card explains the card. Now all you get from reading the card are 20 questions and a migraine. But don't worry, at this rate, it's only going to get much, much worse. But now I want to hear from you. Do you agree with me about the rise of complexity creep in Magic the Gathering and the many problems that it creates? What do you think Wizards of the Coast should be doing, if anything? Let me know in the comments below. And as Magic the Gathering continues to get more and more complex, I hope very much that my guide videos are able to help you in your navigation of this still great game. You can check out my guide to building any commander mana base here, as well as my guide to learning how to be better at taking a mulligan here. Both of these videos are exceptional tools to help you become a better Magic the Gathering player. Hey, thanks once again to Unidragon for sponsoring this video. Do you love puzzles? Are you looking for a high quality puzzle that's even more than just a puzzle? Then you should check out Quezzle, a thousand piece puzzle that becomes a story with quests and mini games afterwards. Build this high quality puzzle and then explore space through four different factions. So if you're a puzzle lover or just looking for the perfect gift for one, check out Quezzle Space Adventurers by following the link in this video's description. Next time on Shuffle Up and Play. Today, we are drafting not just a vintage cube, but a paper vintage cube. Not just a paper vintage cube, but a powered paper vintage cube. That's right, a collection of some of the most powerful cards in Magic's history. I love it. It's like a my own personal museum. Current Magic has got nothing on Dark Ritual oh. and the Hypnotic Specter. Yeah, I was born a few years after it. I thought you were going to say you were born from a dark ritual. <laughs> yeah, that, she, she was. Just look very closely at these two cards. Why is this banned and not this? Tap one, I'm going to Elvish Piper for a Massacre Worm. Boo, 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 boo. Blighted Colossus, when it hits the graveyard, reveal it, and I shuffle it into the library. So at least I get a shuffle. Uh, up and play. Right. I'm going to up and play. <laughs> Don't make me up and play. Yeah. Don't make me up and play.